Uh, hey guys, uh, for everyone here, um, we're UC Berkeley, and uh, one of the great things about our team is that in the past two years, we've done 24 hot fires, uh, nine solid launches, and a liquid launch. So while we may not be half cat with 20 static fires in one year, uh, we're one of the most prolific collegiate rocketry teams, and we do a lot of things that enable us to hit this pace, uh, while maybe kind of avoiding some of the issues your advisors may see with the half cat methodology. Um, so, uh, as opposed to half cat, uh, we're kind of more of a traditional school team, I'd say. We do things, uh, we have a test stand, we pop fire, we collect data, we do CDRs and all of that stuff, um, but we're still able to hit all of our timelines uh, and aggressive timelines, despite these complications that you guys may say may be impeding us. Um, so, with this, uh, we'll kind of go into a hardware and avionics overview of how we're able to accomplish our goals uh, with such a minimal budget. Um, yeah, so let's go into hardware design and ways you guys can save uh, money and cost. So one of the things we focus on is our test stand for uh, engines. And you'll see a lot of teams, uh, the Hapcat guys go straight to a vertical test stand. But for a lot of uh, teams, we're not as confident with our engines. We may be testing that's a bit something that's a bit more experimental. We have less confidence. We're worried about explosions. Um, so our first test stand design was actually a vertically integrated test stand. But if your engine blows up, that test stand might get torched. You have to replace a lot of things. Uh, it's hard to work on. Uh, maybe if you're building a 10 foot tall rocket, it's hard to get up to the top of branch access. Uh, so one of the things we really like emphasizing, are you recording this? Okay. One of the things we really like emphasizing this uh, to other teams when we talk to them is you guys should build a test stand as your first kind of vehicle if you've never had experience uh, building a full vehicle. You can either go kind of the half cat way, but if you kind of want this development experience where you're collecting a lot of data, where you want to work on this thing all the time, um, we recommend that you build a test stand. So this I mean, is, yeah. if you notice, like this test stand is made from parts almost entirely from Home Depot, at least the frame. Yeah. Like everything there, can you can just go to Home Depot and buy that. Yeah, so instead of using fancy 8020 aluminum extrusion that costs a shit ton for all the brackets, uh, we're using Home Depot strut channel um, brackets. We can get laser cut at our shop, uh, things like that. So one of the great things about the test stand is that we use as many commercial components as we can, and we operate them to operate at pressures that uh, we actually want our test stand to run. Like finding a 600 PSI rated cryogenic tank is going to be impossible if you want that to be DOT rated and whatever. Uh, so one thing we do is we're on an aggressive campaign of finding hardware that works at a cheap cost, hydro testing that hardware or putting it through its paces, whether it's under cryo, whether it's under high pressure, figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, so on this tank, we're actually using seamless tanks. And these tanks are fully aluminum. Um, they don't have like a weird seal over here or anything. They're off the shelf. Uh, we hydro test them to uh, 900 psi. We run them at 600 psi, and the they're rated commercially rated. Yeah, 20. they're commercially rated to 200 psi. So we never go above around 100 psi when we're around them. But what that tells you is that you can buy tanks off the shelf immediately. Go go to the store, go to the distributor, pick them up, and have a cryo ready tank ready to go. There's no worries about bucks each. Yeah, 200 bucks each. There's no worry about O rings. You get a 14 liter capacity. If you talk to them, you can get an 18 liter capacity. Um, so that can really help with your speed of operations for a pressure in. Uh, we use a scuba tank, um, so you don't have to worry again. Five rated up to 4,500 psi or 5,000 psi. Now you have a high pressure source, uh, 400 bucks. You don't have to worry about anything. Like this is DOT rated, easy, safe. You can be around it when you it's can be around practice. it. Yeah, you can buy it on Amazon, right? So one of our goals is how do we get as much commercial hardware onto here um, and replace kind of a lot of the custom things teams go for. Like you may see welded tank designs. Uh, you may see teams with massive bolted tanks. And for a lot of times when you're starting out, you don't need a massive custom tank, right? You want to test maybe a five to 10 second burn, you have like a kilogram per second mass flow rate, you really don't need a massive tank. Also with all these massive tanks, you're adding uh, consumption of propellant each test, you're adding consumption of gas, it gets expensive fast. So you wanna minimize your test stand scope from the beginning and whether it's on the avionics or hardware side. Um, so these were some old tanks. Uh, you may see these online, some teams try using them. We had trouble with these at cryo temperatures because they have O-rings. Uh, so by switching to the seamless tank design, where it's actually a complete unibody tank, we avoided those O-ring issues. But again, kind of from our roots, we stick with simple hardware. We have these spring-loaded regulators for our initial testing for macro environments. Um, a lot of teams use dome-loaded regulators. So these are great for your initial first tests. Uh, they work really well. So you don't really have to buy expensive locks rated hardware um, to get things working. Uh, yeah, so you can see these made it onto our flight people. So these tanks uh, are up here and here. We got them kind of custom made. They basically just made a longer tank for us, but it's the exact same. Um, and 18 liter tanks, we have that scuba tank up here. So even on a flight vehicle, these tanks make a lot of sense mass-wise and simplicity-wise, just because you don't have to worry about it, especially if you guys are dealing with locks. Um, the cryogenic method may be more difficult with the half-cat design, uh, but these are kind of a simple solution, right? Move a little bit faster. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so another thing I want to talk about is our valves. Uh, a lot of teams struggle with the cryogenic valves. The moment you introduce cryogens into your system, uh, maybe the half-cat valves will have trouble, right? They're servo opening a ball valve. Problem is, those valves freeze. They're not designed for cryo. The seats get hard, things like that. So our solution is, instead of buying those 500-buck cabinet pneumatically actuated regulators is we buy a 
$30 eBay linear actuator. It's a $40 stainless steel uh, valve with PTFE. And we have the simple linear actuator extends, it opens the valve. So with this- it, Linear actuators are made for like, like massage chairs. Yeah. yeah. So with these, you're using the same valves that FAR recommends for lock service. Um, so you know these valves are safe. Uh, we've used them for cryo purposes you and on McMaster, you can get them. Yeah. 40 bucks on McMaster. We just clean that out the oil, take them apart, clean out the oil, put them back together. Um, and all of this hardware is pretty much off the shelf, right? These are Amazon 25 buck pneumatic cylinders. These have more torque than anything you'll get in those Habenim compact valves, right? So you, you get one with a six inch stroke, you're putting a mass amount of torque on these. These are not going to freeze, right? These are one inch valves. Um, yeah. So you can see we've gone through a few iterations, kind of focusing on different ways of accessing the valves, making it easier to access. But what this really does is it reduces the cost of entry to getting these cryo cryogenic rated valves, because now you don't have to worry about your actuators freezing. Um, the valve is pretty much cryo safe. Uh, and you can kind of put this together with all like laser cut flat panel parts. Um, so that really simplifies things. Uh, over here, um, these are some heaters. I'll talk about that. Oh, you can talk. Yeah. Okay. Um, another thing, when you guys are first doing your engine, um, kind of like the half cap, they do ablative and they do uh, cheat sink engines. One of the things we went with with our first engine that really led us to getting 24 hot fires in two years was using as many commercial off the shelf components as we can. Um, so with this engine, it's an ablative engine. So, but the nozzle is commercial. You can buy this. It's designed for solid rocket motors. Um, the liner over here, again, designed for solid commercial rocket liners. This uh, ablative is a commercial tube ablative that we buy online from KMAC Plastics. It's so, designed for insulation. So all these parts like are designed for solid rocket motors, and then we just size our liquid engine so that we can fit those parts. Yeah, so if you look up the experimental motor casing on RCS or the uh, reusable motor casing on RCS, if you buy that and you size all of your hardware to slide into that casing, then now suddenly you open up a whole world of solid rocket motor propellant technology being able to be used for here. You also get access to nice sizes. You can kind of copy their O-ring groove sizes, stuff like that. It makes it a lot easier because now you're not worried so much about how do I machine a graphite nozzle? How do I make sure that this case will work? Because you're all copying solid rocket motor technology, which generally kind of operates at a much at a higher chamber pressure than you would see with these liquid engines. We're kind of operating these at around 320 PSI chamber pressure. You may see solid rocket motor 600 to 800 PSI. So you know, generally using these components, you're gonna be safe. They're uh, tested, they're easy to get without any custom machining or long lead time parts. Um, so really the only custom part on this was this tube. Um, but again, you can choose an off the shelf tube. Um, also the injector. But again, there's a simple, relatively simple parts. There's one, two, three parts on here. They can all be one, made by two. hand on a lathe. Yeah, so yeah. all of these, you don't want to start involving CNC machining when you're first starting, unless you guys have easy access to that. I don't know what resources different teams have, but with a lathe and a mill, you can make all these parts and that really opens up the accessibility to rapid iteration. Um, yeah, this is also another thing I want to emphasize is uh, uh, trying to take advantage of, again, cheap parts that are not rocketry, uh, rocketry rated. Um, yeah, that, yeah, I gotta move dude, where's the video? Maybe we... Uh... Okay, so... so one thing we did was uh, we did a TVC hot fire and everyone's like, TVC is going to cost five grand right? Like commercial evidence or whatever is like every team is buying thousand dollar linear actuators. Um, we spent uh, $400 on high school robotics hardware, right? And what you're getting is a TVC hot fire that rivals a lot of uh, maybe much more expensive PCI. systems. So. Yeah. You can see there's a lot to be gained. Um, we also do our custom regulation with a lot of robotics components. So by taking advantage of a lot of this COTS hardware, you're really saving money. Um, yeah, so generally on the hardware side, things to avoid, you want to avoid expensive sensing hardware. You want to really choose what you need in terms of sensing hardware. Obviously for rock regime, you kind of want mass flow data, but instead of using cavitating venturies or expensive cryogenic rated mass flow meters, uh, there's a lot of other ways. You can use load cells, capacitive fill, uh, thermocouples along different parts of your tank with heaters to figure out uh, cooling. Um, avoid expensive cryo valves uh, because you can always go cheaper. A lot of things we use is we use eBay swage lock. Um, we use uh, use valves, things like that. They yeah, all... many of the fittings that you find on eBay are like perfectly fine. They're just yeah. surplus from companies and they're like 5X cheaper than yeah. when you buy commercially. Yeah, so I'd always advise you guys to look for the commercial equivalent or try to upgrade um, things. So we use uh, Home Depot ball valves with locks and they seal fine at 600 PSI. It's not a big issue. Um, we clean them out. So, you know, you guys have to, if you guys want to reduce costs and accelerate your testing schedule, it's important to kind of figure out where these optimizations can be made and stop getting stuck in the CDR phase of that design process. It's a fine line between like As being you unsafe see. and yeah. finding things that work for cheap. Like you don't want to be unsafe, but yeah. there, yeah. Yeah, so Andy can talk about uh, how we got our avionics from ground yeah, zero. Quickly, I'll just give a quick overview of avionics. So 
um, you know, you guys don't have to do something fancy. A lot of teams will go and like try to do some crazy setup for their avionics. And then they'll actually go and try to test their system at bar and it breaks and then they can't fix it because it's too complicated. So um, the main thing when you're designing avionics is to keep it as simple as you can to start with and then build up your capabilities incrementally. Um, it's invariably like at least 50% of the time that our team has issues testing, it's always avionics. And so it's a painful lesson, but you just got to keep it as simple as you possibly can. Um, yeah, here are some of the initial things that we did like three years ago. Um, we moved from that to a little bit fancier of a setup with uh, you know PCBs and things like that. Um, yeah, one thing that we this is so this is a, one of our first hot fires where we hard started our engine, um, and we ended up torching the the flight computer that we're using to control our system because we put it on top of the system, which is dumb. Uh, I just wanted to show that as an example of crappy, not scrappy. So yeah, don't do that. Um, in terms of sensors and actuators, kind of like Sohoma was saying, we find things as cheap as we possibly can on Amazon. So for example, we have pressure transducers that cost $18 on Amazon. They go you know, zero to 1,000 PSI. We've used them at close to cryogenic temperatures um, you know, on standoffs to keep them from freezing. Um, they're pretty accurate. We've tested them on, on gas bottles. They're like plus or minus maybe 10, 20 PSI, yeah. just good enough for our purposes. Um, you know, we have these linear actuators cost 30, 32 bucks. Um, and they, they have a lot of torque and, uh, they're good for actuating valves. Um, these, you know, heaters are also like, you know, four for 13 bucks, right? Super cheap. But if you need to keep things warm, keep them from freezing in cryogenic temperatures, you know, 12 volt heaters, just slap a few on. They're sticky on the back, so you just slap them on whatever you want. You could run 24 volts to them. That's what we do. Like, there's that, that quadruples the heat output. So, um, and then, like, also, like, thermocouples, you know, 10 bucks for four of these things, you know, or five, like, super cheap, and they work pretty well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, finding cheap stuff like that rather than buying from name brand, usually it's pretty good. Um, and it's a lot cheaper. Almost the name brand 2M. One thing you want to do is mention is that we actually kind of verify our sensors against known better sources. We made sure to buy a more expensive calibrated gauge. Mm -hmm. um, we know that oh, gauge has history and we calibrate our Amazon pressure transducers according to that gauge. So we relatively know that these Amazon pressure transducers are fine. So you don't want to go into the case where you're buying cheap sensors and not testing them at all, but by kind of having a source of truth that you can test or by getting your thermocouples, doing the hot water, uh, boiling test and freezing water, you can kind of make sure that whatever you're buying is not cheap knockoff stuff, it's kind of legit. Um, and even though the error bars might be higher, on average, you'll kind of get the data you want. So make sure that you know when to kind of test your data and validate it before just throwing it on your test stand. But once you have assurance that these features are gonna work, then why not buy five, test them all really quickly and throw them on the test? Um, I just wanna talk quickly about connectors. So like oftentimes I see teams buying these really fancy automotive connectors for cars and name brand stuff. And usually that's not necessary. Uh, it ends up just costing a lot. And maybe, you know, it is a bit more reliable, but you just pay a lot more money. So after a lot of time on SEB and testing a lot of connectors myself personally, um, I found that these GX12 connectors, um, they're super cheap. Uh, we get them from AliExpress or Amazon if you want to pay more. Um, and they work really well. They're very reliable. Um, you solder to them, so you don't have to worry about crimping. Uh, crimping is good sometimes, but soldering is just, you know, it's fast. Um, you don't need much skill to do it. So, um, and then these T plugs are also extremely cheap. Um, they're used commonly um, in like the RC world for RC cars and stuff, um, but they're very cheap. They work pretty well. Um, and then we also use these like two, two, three and four pin um, waterproof connectors here um, that you can buy on Amazon, you know, 10 bucks or five pairs, which is like, you know, great price. Um, they, they're very reliable, um, water, water, waterproof too, if you want that. Um, and then, you know, these are just kind of waggle connectors that are great for connecting together, you know, wires without any crimping or anything like that. Um, so yeah, after lots and lots of testing, these are the connectors that we've landed on as our set of connectors that we know are going to be reliable and cheap. So, yeah. And then the, the other thing I want to mention is um, when you're operating a test stand remotely or even a rocket, um, you want to have video feeds of some things on the rocket, right? Like valves, freeze it. You want to see things while you're far away. So um, we've found that if you want to go really cheap, you can buy these ESP32 cams, um, which are like, you know, 50 cents each. Like it's completely ridiculous, but they work extremely well. Um, and they connect over Wi-Fi. 
So all you got to do is you just hook up like a, a five volt power supply to those. Um, and you can print a little, a 3D print a little case for them. They even have a light if you want a light. Um, yeah, they're insanely cheap. They're high quality. Um, if you want to go a little bit nicer, um, you can buy these $60 um, security cameras from Amazon. Um, they connect over Ethernet, power over Ethernet, um, fantastic video quality. Uh, could not recommend more. Like, those are fantastic. That's what we use now. Um, yeah, last thing is if you guys are going for PC, designing PCBs, mm -hmm. highly recommend Altium Designer. It's what's used in industry. If you go to any aerospace company, they're going to be using that software, and it's free for students. So just look at look up Altium Designer student license, get that for free. Um, and then we use JLC PCB, which is a Chinese company, um, and it's extremely cheap, like two dollars for five PCBs, um, and the shipping is very fast. You can get your PCB turned around in like a week, week and a half max. Um, so yeah, if you want cheap PCBs, it's a great place to get them. Um, yeah, and then here's kind of where our avionics stands now. So we make these PCBs uh, with GX12 connectors, like I was talking about, soldered directly onto them. Um, we make one type of PCB for each type of sensor or actuator we have, and we connect them all together with Ethernet. Um, so if you guys are looking for a communication protocol for your avionics, Ethernet could not recommend more. You, you buy off-the-shelf hardware like Ethernet switches. You know, your, your computer oftentimes will have an Ethernet port on it. Um, you just plug everything in with commercial cables and it all works. Like Ethernet... Fantastic. Could not recommend that more um, if you're looking for a way to communicate with everything. Um, and then, yeah, that's just a picture of our um, avionics box with some of our PCBs mounted on the outside and, you know, connectors going to that. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to emphasize with all of this is like the test heritage that went into it. So between each iteration of the avionics, it's not like the avionics can be coming up with a new board design. So from the very beginning, if we want to make a board, let's say we breadboarded this and it worked, let's just put that breadboard onto a PCB. Now we have a small PCB, let's add something with Ethernet. Let's uh, continuously develop that. And that way you're not stuck with the case where you do a new, new board design and you have no traceability to the previous design. Yeah, um, like always iterating. Yeah. yeah, so if you go back to the previous slide, you can kind of see the top of all of those PCBs in the thing. So we have that common node that works. It handles all of the communication uh, with other boards um, and handles all the power delivery stuff like that. So once you have that common bus, it's easy to hand out, hey, can you design this new sensor board? And you kind of create the front end hardware for that individual sensor, whether it's a thermal couple pressure transducer or like your own custom sensor, which we have. And then you stick it onto your common board that you know has worked, has test heritage, um, and has been on your test stand for at least a year. And you kind of know that once you integrate it all, even if like the new front end doesn't work that well, you'll have that back end. You'll be able to communicate it with it, figure out what's wrong, and fix it in an iteration. You're not fighting all of your challenges in one go. So yeah, the other main thing that uh, we thought would be relevant to talk about here is uh, we often see people blowing up their chambers by hard starting. Uh, specifically, we've seen ourselves do it. Um, you can see, uh, so our first two main failures, you know, we put together this like very complicated, you know, massive test stand, uh, everything was in place, all the avionics, you know, all the, the, uh, just pressure system, uh, and then the igniter is just duct taped into the nozzle and like, everyone's like, oh yeah, it'll be fine. Um, it was not fine. So you can see what happens. The flow starts, the duct taped igniter flies out. Uh, it all gets ignited in the stream and then back propagates, blows up the whole chamber. So that happened twice. Um, the way that we addressed that uh, the third time was uh, we said uh, we will make an igniter that we can clamp onto the outside of the existing engine, not going to redesign the engine, and we're going to flow it at MEOP, maximum expected operating pressure, and it's going to stay in there. Um, and then we just did some kind of napkin math to make sure that, that it would not stay in there when we actually fired the engine. Uh, One thing about this is Hopcat will argue, let's do an integral igniter. Yeah. Let's say yes. Um, but let's say you've designed your injector, you've tested it, you want something more reliable. One thing that's important about the Hopcat design or our design is the flow heritage. We've flown this at MEOP multiple times. We've and and specifically, it. it's like the, being external, uh, shoot. Um, it, it's very easy to just put it back on. You can see there's like six shear pins. Um, some people on our team will argue that it's a big pain in the ass, but compared to, you know, what it could be, uh, you know, we say not so much. Um, I just put a lot of thought into your igniter because we thought about it last minute the first two times yeah. and it failed. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's igniter is very important. So yeah, you can see it working. Um, so first of all, um, I've got some slides showing actually what's in it, but it's an SD's motor. We drill out the core. Um, basically what happens is, uh, it ignites, it, you know, just fills the whole chamber with a bunch of flames. Uh, and then once we inject, it's like everything's instantly ignited, builds up pressure. 
and then it just yeets it out. You can see. We can like we you know pick it up like like sometimes it tosses it like you know five hundred feet. Sometimes it's gone over the fence. Uh, at far. Yeah, so you can see what we do just to increase the burn time uh, from around two and a half seconds to seven seconds. Um, we just uh, put it on a drill press, drill it out, spray like, you know, water at it sometimes if it gets a little smoky. Um, but uh, just kidding, that doesn't happen because uh, anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, it brings it up to about seven seconds just so we have plenty of margin. Um, and then you can see here, uh, in, in, for the e-matches, we've had issues in the past. We've been burned by like just shoving a bunch of crap in there. And then it like, you know, is not continuous because it shorts. Um, so we have ferals controlling just all the wires in the entire assembly. Um, so the e-matches, we have two e-matches redundancy. We shrink wrap the, the, uh, or tape the, all the metal bits. Um, we clamp ferrules in there. We shove a bunch of just APCP powder in there just to make sure that, you know, it burns. And then the big thing is that we have a brake wire that's connected to our automated, um, our automated start sequence. So essentially this thing lights, if the brake wire doesn't break, i.e. it doesn't melt, it, the motor doesn't light, then the flow is canceled. Right. And that's all automated. Like we're not like looking at it with binoculars or something. Yeah. The thing is that like, that's like definitely more advanced. So like as a start, but it saved out, us. It saved us it from saved hot us, fire, from hard say, starting, like I think one or two times. What's more common is that yeah. teams will just have binoculars. And if you see smoke coming out of the engine, you know your igniter went off and then you hit the start button. But this is like, if you have that avionics heritage, it's like foolproof. Uh, yeah. You know, it just, it just happens. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can see more so just how it clamps onto the nozzle. We just VHB tape it. Uh, it's good for cryo. It's good for everything. Um, and uh, yeah. It's uh, done very well for us. So just wanted to share that. If you're on the r slash rock tree discord, you've probably already seen it. But uh, some of the takeaways from our igniters that are half tech design is one of the things you want to have to be kind of um, You don't want to just get a solid rocket motor off the shelf because the ones that can fit inside your chamber will burn for two seconds, have a super high heat, while shoot a bunch of crap into your injector. Um, so by drilling them out, you're increasing the burn time. So that gives yeah. you more time to react, see the smoke or break a break wire and flow your components. You're burning for longer. Yeah. Um, another takeaway from us is we kind of have redundancy built in. Um, I don't know if the half cat people put two e matches in their chamber, but that's something you know it doesn't hurt. Um, that's something we choose to do. Uh, but again, with that testing, we'll make a batch of igniters, we'll light them off, and make sure the way we assemble them is proper. One thing with student teams versus kind of the half cat is there are maybe experts and they're doing the same thing multiple weekends in the row. They've kind of dialed it in. Maybe they don't know, they know things certain instinctively that may not make it into documentation. So one of the things is we have a good documentation assembly guide that you can, we'll actually, it's on our website. Um, and that kind of, you can pass to new members, have them assemble an igniter, have enough pictures, and then you can fire off that igniter and make sure they assembled it right. And kind of having that process where you're testing and verifying the assembly process and the instructions really improve the reliability as you go towards doing multiple hot fires in May or multiple hot fires in month. Yeah. Um, so yeah, kind of the takeaways from this whole presentation is that there's a lot of hardware you can build that is off the shelf and easily available. But one of the biggest things is going for that rapid testing cycle. So with 24 hot fires in two years, we've learned a lot more than we would by spending more time in the boardroom with CDRs and PDRs. Yeah, like um, start simple, test as often as you possibly can. And also like, it's a cliche at this point, but test like you fly. Yeah. We've really been burned in the past by not testing like we were gonna be testing at FAR. Um, and we've learned our lesson. And so now before we go to FAR, we always do at least two tests at, at our workspace that are exactly the same as they would be at FAR. The flowing at MEOP is we, big, especially if you guys are having like hard start issues, just like flow your igniters at MEOP. If they don't work, they won't work. Yeah, flow, yeah. flow everything yeah. at as high of a pressure as you're allowed to do at your safety, whether that's MEOP or a lower pressure. You want to try to get a flow before you go to FAR. Um, I don't know how that if you guys do that, but no, so, I guess, yeah, but if, you know, when for us, FAR is pretty far away, it's a big drive, it costs around a thousand to two thousand dollars to do a FAR trip. We don't want to go there and try to hold for the first time. So we're doing multiple flows beforehand to like, you know, like industry does the QTP and ATP test program before they stick it on the vehicle. We kind of do the same thing where we say, let's run this engine or vehicle through its paces um, just as we would at FAR. And then you kind of know that when we go to FAR, the issues that would bite us in the back are not things that we could have found at home. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. That's everything. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to ask. Uh, otherwise, thanks for coming. Yeah. Cool. Okay.
Was that like cold flow yeah, that was a cold flow. So that was uh, after flowing with uh, liquid nitrogen in MEOP. Uh, it gets all frosty. It's pretty cute. Um, you can see uh, all of those images are also just um, basically ask any of us after. There's a site where it's all uploaded. Yeah. Um, all the instruction manuals. Um, honestly, I haven't put the SDLs up because I don't think it's applicable to anyone's specific chambers, but the shaft at least could be. So. Yeah. I do I do want to recommend if you guys are starting from scratch with your injector and you do have an injector or junkie that allows for the half cat igniter, you will have more reliability with the half cat style igniter. Um just because again be with this thing yeah. you have to test it, there's more avionics involved. Uh so I think the half cat design is something that we'd recommend if you haven't designed your injector and you have space for that igniter. But if you kind of already sent your igniter off for printing or you have like a coaxial igniter with a thousand elements on the face and we don't have space for that. Um, if you have the avionics heritage and you can do the brake wire, like the brake wire is big because no matter what the case is, like if you're using an Estes motor, you know, you're putting all of the, that's like the crutch of your entire system. And those things have been known to be unpredictable. So brake wire is pretty huge. Yeah. One thing um, from a characterization or characterization content we did, we saw that sometimes the motors, if we drill them out incorrectly, or it's a bad batch or something, they may not burn as intensely and that fails to break the brake wire. Yeah. And that means that, yeah. you know, maybe- no, it's, it's even like yeah. the, if you don't drill it out, it's like, even if you're using the stock Estes motor, like, you know, you just go to like a Boy Scout launch or whatever, you'll see like, you know, a quarter or a fifth or, you know, whatever the fraction is, it's a disturbing amount of them just like either explode, uh, don't ignite or, you know, something happens. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if you, you don't want to propagate that to your fancy liquid system. Yeah, one thing that, is good about the brake wire, right? Is that um, the ignition energy, even if you see it go off with your eyes, maybe that energy wasn't high enough. And maybe 95, 99% of the time, it will ignite your results because it's like locks, right? But you know, something we just added this because we noticed that it was an issue during our testing. And it gives us that kind of peace and confidence that when that brake wire breaks, we can have an energetic ignition and we know it'll light. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Come. Thank you. I'm hoping like 